All right, well, good evening, everyone. My name is Rich Howarth. I'm professor and chair of the Environmental Studies Program. It's a pleasure to invite you or welcome you to this evening's um, edition of the George Link Jr. In lecture Series in Environmental Awareness. This is a long tradition for environmental studies, and it, it engages with the whole Dartmouth community, which is something that we're excited about. Tonight's event is jointly sponsored by the Link Endowment itself. We're very grateful to the Link family for their support to the college. This is a collaborative event, however, and tonight we're, we're joined by the Porter Family Fund for Sustainability in the Curriculum, also by the Irving L. Irving Institute for Energy and Society. Um, is, is Elizabeth Wilson here? <laughs> this is the director, the new director of the Irving Institute for Energy and Society, um, Elizabeth Wilson, who's a professor of environmental studies. Um, I have the pleasure of, of introducing Professor Ann Kapuczynski, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Good evening, welcome everybody. And uh, I'm actually wearing two hats uh, as I do this introduction. Um, as Rich said, I'm a professor in the environmental studies program here. I focus in the sustainably science area. Um, but I also have, um, a, that, that one hat is a supreme honor and pleasure. And I have also another supreme honor and pleasure, which is that I'm currently the chair of the board of directors of the Union of Concerned Scientists. And in fact, that's how I got to know um, our speaker tonight. So tonight we're going to be hearing um, from Ken Kimmel, who is uh, currently the president of the Union of Concerned Scientists. Um, he came to UCS in 2014, and I met him several months before then uh, on the search committee for the president of UCS. And uh, vividly remember when he first walked in the room, um, I had sort of this gut feeling that he was our guy, and uh, that turned out to be correct. Um, so before I say more about Ken, though, I'd like to just give you a little feel about Union of Concerned Scientists, because tonight Ken's going to be talking to you about climate and energy, which is one of the key program areas and foci of Union of Concerned Scientists, but I just want to fill in a little bit more for you. First, I should maybe start by letting you know that uh, Union of Concerned Scientists was founded um, by scientists, including graduate students and um, faculty members at MIT in 1969. Um, so we're actually coming up on the 50th anniversary um, of, of UCS, which is pretty exciting. Um, and really from its beginning, and it's really um, been able to accomplish this um, today, it's become a, a leading science-based nonprofit. And uh, what we really focus on is combining the knowledge and the influence of the scientific community with the passion of concerned citizens to influence policy decisions and actions um, at the federal level um, and at the state level um, in the United States. And we're very uh, focused on wanting to build a healthy planet and a safer world. So to do that, we have several programs. We have the Climate and Energy Program, which you'll get a feel for tonight. Um, we also have a Food and Environment Program. We have a Global Security Program, which really focuses on nuclear security issues around nuclear um, armaments, but also nuclear power, and that's actually was the first topic area that was the start of the Union of Concerned Scientists. Um, we have a clean vehicles program, and our latest um, addition to our work um, with the generous support of a donor that helped to start it is a Center for Science and Democracy that started a few years ago now. Um, little did we know how timely um, it would be to have a Center on Science and Democracy. And if you want to hear more about that, I'm sure that there'll be opportunities in the question and answer session um, with Ken. So uh, let me come back a little bit to telling you about Ken. So Ken has more than 30 years of experience um, in government, environmental policy, and advocacy. And prior to us wooing him to you know, concern scientists in May of 2014, um, he was in a very important position. He was the commissioner of the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, large agency, if any of you, uh, you know, keep track of what different states do in the climate and energy area, you know that Massachusetts is kind of one of the leaders um, nationally, and Ken had, um, you know, a lot to do with some of that. And uh, while he was commissioner, one of his important roles is that he was the chairman um, of the board of the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. Some of you might know that by its acronym, REGI, um, which helped to prod 
the nine member states, including where we are now um, in, in the Northeast, to reduce power plant uh, carbon emissions by almost 50 percent through 2020. Um, and that helped to reduce emissions in the region by some 90 million tons. Um, so that was a big accomplishment. Um, before being commissioner um, of the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection, he also served as general counsel at the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs in the office of the Massachusetts governor, at the time Governor Deval Patrick. So he was uh, serving in um, Governor Patrick's administration. Um, I won't tell you about the other things he did in the interim, but I do want to just give you one little tidbit earlier in his career that I think really fits with the um, aims of the George Link lecture, which is focus on environmental awareness. Uh, what really led Ken to decide to focus his legal work on environmental issues was from clerking for the U.S. District Court in San Francisco, where he assisted a judge in a case that was involving the health effects of Agent Orange. Those of you who lived through the Vietnam War era know um, that the story about Agent Orange is definitely um, uh, a messy story, and there were very important roles um, of the legal community in dealing with that issue. Uh, he has a bachelor's degree from Wesleyan University, and his law degree is at the University of California, um, Los Angeles, UCLA. A uh, final thing I'd like to share with you about Ken is to give you a feel that he really walks the talk of UCS and that he not only leads that organization and you know, takes part in events like this, but he also really projects um, the presence and the message of the organization through the mass media, um, and he is quoted widely um, in the media. Just to give you an example, um, very recently on October 19th, the New York Times ran an op-ed that he co-authored with Bill Riley, who had been the EPA administrator under President George Herbert Walker Bush, Bush Sr., um, and uh, this op-ed was basically arguing that automakers should not fight um, the emission standards, which had actually begun to be rolled out under the prior administration. So without further ado, I'll turn over this, the um, podium to Ken, and uh, you see the title of his talk there on the first slide. Thank you. And I should add that Ken has become both a great colleague and a dear friend. Thank you for that great introduction, Anne. What a delight to be here. Um, I guess I want to say first impressions are really important because I'm certain that I flubbed many of the interview questions when I came to visit with you uh, when I was being considered. But I'm glad to know I made a first Im good first impression and that got me over the hoop. So, um, But it really is a treat to be here at Dartmouth. I get to hang out with Anne uh, approximately three times a year during UCS board meetings. And so she kind of comes to our turf. It's, fun. it's really fun for me to come to yours and to see all you here. Um, and to talk about something that uh, I care passionately about, which is climate change. So I'm afraid that I'm going to start tonight uh, with a pretty big dark cloud, <laughs> but I promise to end with a silver lining. Um, so, so that's the deal. The dark cloud, of course, is the ferocious attack on the progress that we've actually made on climate change by the new administration in Washington. The silver lining is all the opportunities that resisting this attack gives us to grow a stronger and more viable movement over the long term. So to, to start the, the, the dark cloud and the silver lining, I want to start with uh, one of the most important international agreements that ever has been made. It's the Paris Climate Agreement. By the way, I had the pleasure of being with Anne um, in Paris when the climate agreement was struck, and it was uh, quite an amazing time to be with all these countries, all in the same boat, rowing in the same direction. So uh, the climate agreement is, is, is central. Um, it does a number of different things. It sets a goal to hold uh, temperature increases to no more than two degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels, um, and it actually encourages uh, the world to actually get well below two degrees. Um, it includes pledges from 197 countries. Each country has come to the table saying what they will do uh, to deal with uh, their emissions. It has a mechanism built in that we will come back every five years with, a, with an eye towards increasing the level of ambition. I'll say why that's so important in a moment. There are provisions to monitor and report and verify so that each country will know 
uh, what other countries are doing and whether they're living up to their pledges. And finally, uh, there's an expectation that the uh, prosperous nations will help the less prosperous nations both lower their carbon emissions but also deal with um, adaptation and resilience. So, uh, of course, one of the most irresponsible actions that's happened from President Trump is the pledge to pull out of the agreement. As people uh, may know, uh, it will take four years to get this done, but the announcement has been made that we will pull out. Um, that means that uh, the United States has the rare distinction of joining a, uh, a group of three countries, Syria and Nicaragua, and the United States are now the only three countries that are not in this agreement. Even North Korea is in the Paris Agreement. So it's a very, very uh, unfortunate thing. And of course, one of the things that many of us worried about when Trump announced the pullout was what would be the reaction of the rest of the world? Would other countries that are in the agreement say, well, if the United States isn't going to be part of this, uh, we're not going to be either? So far, that hasn't happened. And in part, that hasn't happened because of the response to the pullout. And when we get to the silver lining part of the talk, I'm going to spend a little more time on that. Um, but what I do want to make clear about the Paris Agreement is that it left behind a very significant gap, a gap between the ambitions that are in the agreement versus what the science tells us we need to do. So I'm going to illustrate this. This green line is global, actual global emissions. Um, that baseline over there is projecting the emissions forward, assuming we don't do any new policies. And you can see that that gets us to a world of over four degrees centigrade average increase. That's not a world that any of us want to live in, and that's certainly not a world that we want our children to live in. Now, if we look, and I'm going to try to get this right, at this area right here where the gray meets the black, that's the projection of what the Paris Agreement will do. And that's the substantial progress. That gets us to a little under three degrees centigrade increase. Uh, of course, that's assuming that every country meets their pledge and meets it on time, which may be a, a very heroic assumption. But that's what the agreement does. But what's most striking about it, whoops, is that that's where we have to get just to get to the two degree goal. And remember, that's not, even the, uh, that's not even the goal of Paris. The goal is to get well below two. So there's an enormous gap between what we have in place right now and what we need to do to meet this climate challenge. And unfortunately, over the last month, we have been reminded about what this gap means in terms of human life. Storm after storm, unprecedented high winds, unprecedented rainfall, this is uh, Hurricane Harvey, where they had to send uh, the National Guard in to Houston to rescue people from their homes. Many people during the storm had to flee their homes with just what they could carry. Then we saw Hurricane Irma literally uh, destroy the island of St. Martin. And now Hurricane Maria, um, we have all these people living in Puerto Rico without basic uh, food and water and electricity, and we know that climate change has the fingerprints all over these storms. These rising ocean temperatures is what fuels these hurricanes, and the rising air temperature is what, uh, what holds all that water and dumps it down in these storms. This is also, this is a photo of uh, Sonoma in California where we've seen uh, horrible ravages of fires, once again in part uh, because of climate change. Uh, the hot and dry temperatures creating all this kindling uh, that just comes up. So we are truly in a moment uh, where the world has finally come to an agreement and set a course in the right direction and we clearly don't have a moment to lose. And into that moment comes President Trump, who basically has said that climate change is fake news and whose main economic strategy appears to be to try to expand the three industries that have done the most to cause climate change, which is oil, coal, and gas. But it's not just his words that we should be worried about. It's the actions and the implications. 
So one of the things that keeps us up at night is what I call scorched earth laws. And I call them scorched earth laws because Washington is a place of tremendous inertia. It's very hard to change a law once it gets passed. And so one of the things we worry about are laws that could get passed during the Trump administration that would then tie the hands of the president's successor if he or she was trying to do the right thing. So we're worried about changes, for example, to the Clean Air Act, which might take away the EPA's authority to address climate change. We're worried about anti-science laws that take away the ability of our agencies to issue regulations to deal with new threats. And so uh, this scorched earth law is a, is a looming threat um, that is something that we're focusing a lot of our resources on. So far, I, I'm pleased to report it hasn't yet materialized, but we're just uh, 10 months in. A second thing uh, that's happening is regulatory rollbacks. Now, the, the problem here is we made a lot of progress on climate under the Obama administration, mostly through regulations. And these are regulations that don't have to be approved by Congress. But unfortunately, just as one president can issue regulations, a successor president can undo those regulations. And uh, Scott Pruitt at EPA uh, and the, tr the Trump administration are going uh, at regulations like a wrecking ball. I have never seen so many uh, regulations that are on the chopping block. And the two uh, most important ones are shown on this slide. On the left side, is something called the Clean Power Plan, which is our nation's first limits on the amount of CO2 that comes out of uh, power plant stacks. It's kind of hard to believe uh, if you think about it. We regulate all sorts of pollutants from power plants, but until the Clean Power Plan, which was developed a few years ago, we allowed power plants to emit an unlimited amount of CO2. So these regulations finally uh, put a limit on that. Um, Scott Pruitt announced uh, several weeks ago uh, his intention to repeal that plan in its entirety, um, and it's unknown whether he will replace it with anything. On the right-hand side is the other crown jewel of the Obama administration climate policy, which is fuel economy standards, a rule that will double by 2025 the amount of miles per gallon that all of our cars uh, go. A huge, huge, uh, benefit, that was the subject of the op-ed that Ann mentioned, a benefit in terms of lowering our carbon emissions, a benefit in terms of saving consumers money at the pump, and a benefit in terms of our reducing, reducing our dependence on oil. Now, unfortunately, the auto industry uh, agreed to all of these standards back in 2010, and now they suspect that they have a friendly administration and they have asked uh, the EPA to reopen these standards and review them, and we believe that uh, their goal is ultimately to weaken them. So that's, that is also very much in the crosshairs. And sometimes a president or his administration can make progress not with changing a law or with a regulation, but by cutting out the budgets of key agencies and hollowing out their capacity to do their job, and that's exactly what's happening. Some of the worst budget cuts that were proposed by President Trump happen to be for the agencies that do climate science, agencies like EPA and NOAA, the USDA, the Department of Energy. But we're worried not just about the cutting of the budget. We're also worried about the exodus of all these senior scientists at these agencies who don't want to work for an agency that isn't actually advancing the mission of that agency. We also worry about younger scientists and will they want to come work for an EPA that's not really doing its job in protecting public health and safety. And finally, the attack also is on many independent boards that advise EPA and other agencies. And believe it or not, uh, Scott Pruitt announced a few weeks ago that he wants to get rid of uh, scientists, academic scientists who get government grants because allegedly they have a conflict of interest. But he's fine with industry paid scientists to serve on these advisory boards. So go, go figure that. Um, talk about the politicization of science. So we're very much worried in terms of that scorched earth analysis, analogy 
that even if we can fight off these budget cuts, what will these agencies look like in four years after this attack? And will they be able to do their job when, when a replacement president comes? Adding to the, the mix is what I call climate denial 3.0. Climate denial 1.0, that was a few years ago when people were saying climate change is a hoax. So we heard that one. That did not work very well with the American people. Most people do not think it's a hoax. So then there was climate denial 2.0, which was for leaders to say, I'm not a scientist, so I can't really say whether it's happening or not. Um, that also really didn't resonate very well. Most Americans know that you know, senators and congressmen are not necessarily experts in every subject. But we expect them to learn up about it and consult with people who are experts and act accordingly. So that one didn't really work either. So now we're on climate denial 3.0. And it's a little different. It's basically saying, I know the climate's changing. Something's up. But I really can't say with precision you know, how much of that is really caused by uh, human factors, how much is it caused by other factors. I, I don't know exactly what the impact will be. I don't know when the impact's going to hit. Um, and there's no real punchline to that, but the, but the punchline is, so, so we really shouldn't do anything about it yet because we're not ready. Now, the reason why this is so concerning at this point, this is the statement of the Trump administration. These are governmental officials in positions of leadership making these statements, and we've all got to be concerned that the American people um, will, or at least some people, will be swayed by this and will think that there really is some doubt about climate change, and maybe the scientific community uh, is, is not all on board and in it um, because they, have, they hear their leaders saying on over, over again, it's in doubt. So these are some things that are a very uh, dark place to be for us at a moment when we really need to show climate leadership. And I want to give you a sense uh, of what the effects might be on our climate policies. And I'm, again, going to show a graph that illustrates our actual emissions to date. This is what uh, was projected, the progress we would make under the Obama administration policies. And you can see that we're getting in striking distance of getting to 26 to 28 percent below 2005 levels. The reason I point that out is that is the pledge we made in the Paris Agreement. That's what we told the world we would do. Um, so even if uh, you know, Hillary Clinton had been elected, we would still need to do some additional things to get to our pledge. But what's really worrisome, um, if the clean power plan is rolled back, if the fuel economy standards are rolled back, et cetera, this is what uh, some people project we will be. Um, basically in a situation where our progress has really slowed down or really stalled out. So our job is to make sure that this slide never becomes reality. It's really that simple. And that uh, now brings us to the silver lining. So one thing that is great is that almost immediately there has been a grassroots <coughs> resistance to this. And you see it uh, in all the marches. The Women's March, the day after the inauguration. The Scientists March, the March for Science, which uh, I was there 75,000 people in Washington, and the People's Climate March. Well, I'm just curious, how many of you attended one of these marches, either there or somewhere else? Yeah. So that, that is really good. Um, it's clear that there is a uh, coalition of fact-based people forming who know that science needs to be part of the equation, who care not only about climate change, but many other threats. And their voices are being heard, and I will say from the vantage point of my organization, we have seen an incredible upsurge in activism. Um, we have many thousands of scientists, 24,000 scientists all across the country who are really begging us for, to give them direction and how they can be uh, active citizens and active advocates. Um, and there's groups like ours uh, all over the country forming uh, and getting strong and investing in a grassroots ability to put a stop to some of this. And I have to say, so far, um, that group has been very successful in blocking some of those scorched earth laws that I talked about from happening in the US Senate, which is where we're close. It's a 52-48 split. What we're seeing on most things, not everything, is the 48 Democrats are holding very firm as a block. 
Um, and sometimes we've been successful in picking off uh, several different Republicans who have joined and, and stopped some of the worst things from happening. And I do want to say you have two great senators here, Senator Hassan and Senator Shaheen. They have been uh, like a rock. Um, and they deserve all of our support for, the, for their votes. So that's been successful, uh, again, so far. Um, we will also block these, do everything we can to block these regulatory rollbacks. And the thing that people should understand is President Trump and Scott Pruitt can't just eliminate a regulation with a stroke of a pen. It goes through a long legal process. There's opportunities to mobilize. There's opportunities to comment. And we will be active, as will many others, in fighting these rollbacks. And one of the best things we can do is put pressure on the companies that are calling for the rollbacks. And so those car standards I told you about, Scott Pruitt isn't doing those because he just feels like it. He's doing that because he's hearing from the car companies themselves. And all of us need to hold these companies accountable because they all agreed to these standards. Um, they agreed to build cleaner, more efficient cars. You may remember back in about 2008, 2009, many of them were in bankruptcy, and they needed federal help to get them on their feet. And part of the deal was they would reorient and get real and start building cars uh, that, are, that are clean and efficient. And it's distressing that they're having buyer's remorse now, and they're trying to change the deal. So we've really got to uh, put pressure on them, and, and that's, that's the way to, to fight this. Now, sometimes we're not going to win these battles, and so there will be a role to go to court. This is a picture of my hero, Atticus Finch. Actually, it's Gregory Peck playing Atticus Finch uh, in, in To Kill a Mockingbird. This is the reason, by the way, that I wanted to uh, become a lawyer, because I was so inspired by, by his example. And we are seeing, we are seeing uh, an important pushback from the, judici from the judiciary. We saw it uh, almost right away with the suits over the, uh, the, the Muslim ban. I know they call it a travel ban. I call it a Muslim ban. And it was really important because the Trump administration marched into court with a lot of slogans. And judges don't go by slogans. They actually want facts and evidence and law. So that is a good forum for us to be in. And so far on the environmental front, uh, Scott Pruitt has tried to roll back three regulations and has been taken to court on each of them and is lost. So this is an important forum um, that we can participate in and, and, and block some of the change. But there's a lot more to be optimistic about than just the fact that we're playing good defense. There's some trends that are really favorable and will really help bend that curve down as long as we get in the way. Because really this clean energy train has left the station. And I want to just go over four really important trends that matter the most. The first is uh, we are shutting down coal plants. Coal was about 50% of our energy supply in 2008. It's now down to about 30%. And many are projecting uh, it will be down to about 10 or 15% by 2040. And that's going to happen regardless of any policies that President Trump is going to try to put into place because the economics of coal just don't work when compared to gas and when compared to renewables. A second trend is that what is increasingly replacing these coal plants is solar energy and wind energy. Over the last two years, two thirds of the new power plants being built in the United States are solar or wind. So that's a huge transition that's going on that's still below the radar screen, perhaps, in popular consciousness. But it's a trend that's real and it's happening. A third trend, and I think you've actually seen this here on your campus, is that by becoming a more energy efficient country, energy demand has basically stayed flat since about 2007, even after our economy has grown. So we have successfully decoupled energy use from economic growth. And that's a, that's a tremendous achievement. And the fourth is on the horizon. But many people believe that by the early 2020s, the price of a battery that you use for an electric car will have dropped so much that it will be the same price or less to buy an electric car than to buy a gas-powered one. 
And when that happens, there will be uh, quite a disruptive rush to electric vehicles. So these are great market trends, and that keeps, gives, makes me optimistic. But there's also some leadership trends that are good, too. We have seen a remarkable uh, standing up from the business community who has said that they are still in this climate fight and they're putting their money uh, where their mouth is and buying increasingly large percentages of renewable energy. Google, for example, has pledged that by 2018, uh, all of its power will be from renewable sources. There's also tremendous leadership in states. You have a handful of uh, coastal states like California and Oregon, New York and Massachusetts, all of which have adopted climate goals that are far more ambitious than what President Obama pledged as part of the Paris Agreement and putting in places to meet them. But it's not just these states that are in this game. A state like Illinois just passed a comprehensive energy bill that will make it a clean energy leader. And you have some red states like North Carolina that now has the second most amount of solar energy in the country, which is a surprise to a lot of people. You have the state of Texas, known as the home of oil and gas. Well, it invested $7 billion in transmission lines. It's now made it one of the biggest wind energy producers in the world. And you have the state of Iowa, which is now getting 40% of its energy from wind. So a lot of these leaders are not getting up every morning and thinking what they can do about climate change. They're just looking at price signals. But the price signals are working to our advantage. Another very important development, and this ties back to what I said about the Paris Agreement, is essentially the day that President Trump pledged to back out of Paris, you had all these governors, mayors, university presidents, uh, cities, um, and others standing up and saying, notwithstanding what President Trump says, we are still in. And we will find a way to step up our own climate policies to fill the void left behind. This was an enormously important statement to send and reassure the world that this is real. And these states and others will be at the, uh, the COP, which is the Conference of the Parties, in a couple of weeks. We've got to keep this message going, and we've got to make sure the world understands that climate policy isn't written by Donald Trump alone. There's many, many other actors in society that have a stake here. And so it's very good to see these leaders stepping up. And now I want to uh, give a little shout out to what we're doing here in New England. Uh, Anne mentioned in my biography that uh, I was the chair of the Reggie program. This was the first uh, cap and trade program in the United States for carbon emissions. And New Hampshire is part of it. And what it does in the nine states that participate, it sets an overall cap on carbon emissions from power plants. And rather than have the government tell each plan exactly how much to cut, it sets up essentially a market me mechanism in which power plants have to buy an allowance for each ton of carbon that they issue. Now, this has been uh, a very successful program. It got renewed and reinvigorated over the summer. And you can see that in this nine-state REGI region, it looks like we're going to cut our emissions from, of carbon from electricity by about 65% from 1990 levels. So that's the kind of level of ambition we need. The other thing that's really great about this program is that the governments don't give away these allowances. They auction them off. And they have typically used the revenues to invest in things like energy efficiency. In fact, uh, Dartmouth uh, was the recipient of a grant from the REGI program of about $300,000 in 2009, which helped uh, Dartmouth get a handle on its energy use. Now, I will say, uh, since we're in New Hampshire, um, this program continues to be under attack uh, in the state legislature. Uh, some legislators have tried to uh, get New Hampshire to pull out of the program. Fortunately, that, that hasn't happened. Um, but there is a way in which New Hampshire doesn't quite optimize this program, because rather than investing the proceeds in things like energy efficiency, most of the proceeds just go back to consumers. And while I can very much understand, particularly for low-income uh, members of the state, why that would be attractive, you might think that uh, reinvesting more of the proceeds for, for others who can afford to pay uh, might be a better use of the funds. And so as you think about this program, 
Um, keep an eye on it. Uh, keep an eye on what the legislature is doing with it and make sure that they stay in this program. It's been, it's been very, very successful. So I want to now uh, come back to the question I posed. Are we still in? The answer is yes, we are still in. We, 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 we are still in this battle. We're still making progress on climate change. But the math and that graph that I showed you before about the ambition gap remains. And so what we've really all got to focus on is how do we close that ambition gap? What can we do here in the United States that will really make a difference? So I'll go over a few things. Um, one is to recognize that the real problem right now is much more in transportation than in electricity. This is again the Reggie states, the nine state region. You can see that we're projected to really cut our electricity use or, or our, our emissions, but transportation estimates are we're going to stay about flat. So that's really not an acceptable outcome. So we've, we've got to focus like a laser beam on the emissions that come from transportation, which are now the biggest source here in New England. Um, so one of the obvious things to think about is taking our successful REGI program that covers electricity and expanding it to cover transportation, just as uh, California does. The advantage of this is we could raise billions of dollars that we could put into mass transit, that we could put into electric vehicles and, and electric buses, that we could use to help people who live in rural areas who are using old, clunky cars that break down and emit a lot of carbon and give them the opportunity to get into uh, more efficient cars. And so uh, this is a, an idea that has caught fire in New England, there are a number of states that would like to see the REGI program expanded. Um, your governor right now has not uh, said which way he wants to go on this. Uh, I would urge you as part of your state activism to encourage Governor Sununu um, to back this idea of taking a program that works and expanding it to deal with a current problem. We also have to get much more serious about our alliances. Um, this is a picture uh, of uh, folks in Jefferson Parish in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. Um, these are the communities that are really bearing the bunt, the, the main brunt of climate change. These are communities that we have to do a better job partnering with and making our cause theirs and making their cause ours for this movement to really get strong. But we also have uh, potential alliances in places in the Great Plains, for example, where the local economies are benefiting enormously from this clean energy transition. That guy who's sitting uh, atop that uh, wind farm is in the fastest growing job in the United States. The average salary uh, is $51,000. And so you would think that folks who are in this industry would be a natural ally in making sure that this clean energy transition continues and isn't uh, rolled back. We also have another potential friend here, which is the electric utility industry. We need the utility industry to see that they are in a competition with the oil industry for uh, future transportation. It's either going to be oil or it's electricity. And so far, the utility industry has been pretty tame and pretty tepid about stepping into this space. But here's the good news. They work for us. These utilities get a monopoly from the state, and in exchange for that monopoly, they have to serve the public interest. So there's nothing stopping us from directing this industry to make major, major investments in electrifying transportation, in building charging stations in places that are convenient, in giving people uh, technical assistance and installing chargers in their house, and all the things that need to get done to make that change. We also have to embrace and put policies in place to speed up some new technologies. These are lithium ion batteries. This is so important because we're getting to the point now where energy storage is getting to be cost effective. And when we reach that point, solar and wind coupled with energy storage will beat out any fossil fuel, whether it's coal or gas. So we've got to accelerate and get to that point. Um, the wind industry and the solar industry benefited greatly from state and federal incentives that helped them go down the cost curve. We really need to do the same thing for energy storage and to get it to the point where it makes fossil fuel generation all but obsolete. And we have to uh, take advantage of a new technology, which is driverless 
vehicles, which have a tremendous potential, if we get the rules right, to replace our uh, gas combustion cars with a whole new fleet of electric vehicles. Again, if we get it right. If we just allow it to happen without any guidelines, we may not get there. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Dartmouth. I am very impressed by some of the things I'm seeing here. I read uh, about the commitment to uh, put in a lot of solar panels. I read about the fact that Dartmouth has expanded uh, its physical plant, yet reduced its energy use. And I was very heartened to read the sustainability roadmap, uh, which came out this year. Probably many of you worked on that document, which really articulates some uh, very ambitious goals. 50% renewable energy by uh, 2025. 50% reduction in emissions. That's about twice what Obama pledged for the United States for the Paris Agreement. So that, that is fantastic. Um, but that plan doesn't have a lot of details on it. It wasn't supposed to, so that's not a criticism. So you are in a unique place right now where you have gotten the top uh, officials at Dartmouth to embrace some really great goals. And now you're in a conversation about how to uh, achieve that. And so for example, there's a lot of talk about replacing the, the number six fuel, fuel, uh, fuel oil burners. Um, that's a conversation that's going on all across the country. Um, so I would really encourage you as students to get very involved in this conversation. This is a moment of leverage here uh, when you have a campus that's committed to a set of goals but hasn't yet committed to the means. And so you really want to make sure um, that whatever the solutions are that get picked, first of all, really meet this goal, are based on science and are based on uh, considering the long term as, as, as opposed to short term fixes. If you don't get this right, it may be another 25 or 30 or 40 years till you have this chance again. So I, I, I really think as students, you've done a marvelous job in helping the administration to uh, move into a high ambition place, uh, but now making sure it actually happens is, is vitally important. So to summarize, what can you do? Um, you can lead by example with your school, and you have a really great opportunity to do that right now. You can join movements like UCS's or the Indivisible Movement and influence your state and federal leaders. And I can't emphasize enough, I know New Hampshire is a little state, but it is a really important state politically. Uh, no other state gets the attention from presidential candidates that you do. It's just there's nothing like it anywhere in the country. Um, and New Hampshire is still kind of a swing state. It goes both directions. So getting leaders from both parties to embrace climate friendly policies is, is so important. Um, so New Hampshire really matters. And of course, you can always uh, join UCS and other groups that are, that are fighting these fights. So I want to close uh, with a picture of another hero of mine, Dr. Martin Luther King. And he's a hero because he marched so bravely into danger despite the odds. And I always think about what he says when he describes his work. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. I definitely believe that's true, and there are many examples that I can cite to in my own life that validate that. But when it comes to climate change, unfortunately, the arc is bending in all the wrong direction. And it's going to take an incredible movement by a large number of people to get that arc bending in the other direction. We have no time to lose here. So we've got to stop this uh, Trump administration rollback. And we've got to make progress wherever and whenever we can with new allies, with new leaders, with new technologies, with new policies. Because let's face it, uh, this is the only planet we have, and there is no plan B. Thank you. OK, we have a, sort of a tradition at Dartmouth of uh, giving our students a first chance to ask questions. So I just thought I would help you all come over here. Help heal hands, and there are some robot microphones. Is that right? Mm -hmm. um, so if you raise your hand, then we'll send you a microphone. Do you have a microphone or two, Kim? Okay. All right. So <coughs> questions for Kent. Thank you very much, Kent. Let
Hello. Hi. Uh, you said that it would take four years for us to pull out of this agreement. Uh, could you go over a little bit of what that entails in the process of pulling out over four years? Sure. Well, uh, someone was pretty smart when they wrote the rules for uh, pulling out of the agreement. Um, and it set it up. I think the way it works is, uh, let me see if I get the dates right. The president uh, has to give one year's notice. And then at the end of that one year notice period, three years have to elapse in order to pull out of the agreement. So if you add it up, that gets to four years. As a formal matter, I'm not sure exactly what happens. There's probably a document that needs to get signed. But it turns out that the uh, four years expires uh, a couple of days after the November election. One of your projections uh, that I, I think it was, if, if we didn't have regulations, was uh, four, uh, four degrees centigrade increase. Can you talk about uh, what that would look like in crossing into that threshold? And sure, sure. Well, first of all, four degrees centigrade, uh, about seven, that's about seven degrees Fahrenheit, plus or minus. That is an average global temperature increase. Um, so we, we know that this is not spread out evenly. So that is, I'm just going to throw out a number, that's 10 or 12 or 15 degrees hotter um, in the North and, and the South Poles. So that is a massive amount of um, sea level rise caused by ice melting. Um, you live here in New Hampshire uh, with a seven degree increase. It would be like living in South Carolina. Um, that your summers would be like living in South Carolina. Uh, we would see uh, three feet, four feet, five feet of sea level rise on average. Um, it would be a, ca a, a catastrophe. Um, and, and further adding to that, and we were talking about this at dinner, is some of the really scary feedback loops. Turns out that there's a lot of carbon, for example, that's stored underneath the permafrost in Siberia and, and other places. And with the melting that would occur, it would unleash huge amounts of stored carbon there and make it even harder to fight climate change. So four degrees centigrade uh, is, is a catastrophe. you had like any what the UCS is doing with methods of like carbon restored from the atmosphere so like is there anything that you guys are doing that doesn't deal with just like purely regulation and preventative things but more like taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere well we are following this there there are people who are increasingly having that conversation about pulling it out of the atmosphere no one has a technology to do that of course we, let's let's state the obvious trees do that um, so <laughs> we're very much in favor of uh, all sorts of uh, reforestation efforts and also preserving forests as they are and not cutting them down. So trees can continue to play that role. Um, we and others will continue to look at the science on that. There really uh, isn't anything available yet. Um, the, the closest thing there is, um, and we have very mixed feelings about this too, is this idea of um, spraying aerosols into the atmosphere, which would mimic what volcanoes do. It turns out when volcanoes erupt, they spew a lot of particles into the atmosphere, and temperatures go down because they're essentially blocking the sun's rays from coming in. So that's a little farther along right now, and there are some people who are actually proposing to do some pilot projects. Um, but the, the idea of, of getting the carbon out of the air or getting it out of the ocean uh, is not an idea yet that's achieved a, a real scientific validity. There was a National Academy of Sciences study on it a few years ago, which portrayed it as uh, pretty far away in time, and also potentially sub <clears throat> subject to some significant uh, ancillary, unexpected, or unanticipated downsides if you did it. So I don't think we're going to get there that way. Um, you mentioned that there's not really any scorched earth laws that is on the table right now, but what are some of these laws that you're most scared of going into the current administration? Of being changed, you mean? Yes. 
So uh, the main one is the, the Clean Air Act, although it was passed in 1970 and then uh, passed again in 1990. Although it wasn't mainly about uh, greenhouse gases, it has been interpreted by the courts to allow EPA to regulate greenhouse gases. And remember I showed you the slide with the clean power plan and the fuel economy standards? The EPA is relying upon the Clean Air Act as the legal authority to do that. If that law were changed um, and, and EPA was stripped of its authority to regulate greenhouse gases, that would be a, a serious blow. Now fortunately, um, we live in a federal system, so EPA could say that, but that wouldn't stop California or New York or New Hampshire, for that matter, from doing that regulation. So that's important, but it's always better to do these things at a national level, and so, so that, that would be a code red situation for us. What's being done about like the agricultural industry and like raising livestock because that's also a significant con contributor? It is a significant contributor and it really hasn't been uh, approached with the vigor that it deserves. Um, one of the things that we're working very hard on with others is looking at different agricultural practices that are better in terms of retaining carbon in the soil. So that, that's one thing that can be done is mar modern farming methods. But um, really, uh, agriculture is, it, this is a tough uh, sector to regulate. There's a lot of political power behind it. Um, and so it's, it's hard to get at that way. I mean, I, when we talk about what we can all do um, per, in our personal lives to deal with climate change, one of the things, of course, is to reduce or eliminate our consumption of beef, which I, I have not done, but um, I'm, I'm at least trying to reduce. Precisely because um, those emissions, uh, particularly from beef, are, are a significant part of the problem. Okay, I think there was a hand here, and then I'll move over this way. Right here. Hi. So during your presentation, there was significant focus on wind, on solar, on regulation in order to try to cut emissions. Uh, what do you think of uh, potential alternative solutions such as nuclear or carbon capture or any other solutions you may think? So um, we would very much like to see carbon capture technology uh, get to a point where it's cost effective. Um, one of our real beefs against the oil industry is that uh, back in the 80s and 90s when they knew exactly what their product was doing to the environment, we think that they would have been in a marvelous position to use their technology and their know-how and their understanding to really invest in carbon capture and storage. And had they done so, we might be in a position now where that would be a viable technology. So we very much favor uh, federal funding being used, uh, research dollars being used. So far, though, it hasn't been very effective. Um, it, that could change, um, but there's one plant, uh, I think it's in Texas, that was gonna be built. Uh, it turns out it's never going to get built, and the best it was going to do was about as good as a, ga as an, as a gas plant. Um, so not nearly as good as, as wind and solar. But that being said, an important technology, and, and someday there will be a breakthrough there. On nuclear, uh, we have mixed feelings. Um, obviously, part of our group works on nuclear power safety. Um, and we're not crazy about the uh, attention to safety that's exhibited either by the nuclear power industry or by the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which has sole authority over them. But that being said, we're very concerned about plants that are operating right now that are being operated safely uh, that could be shut down for economic reasons. And we've seen in New England already uh, that as some of these plants have shut down, our carbon emissions are starting to go up to the extent they're being replaced by natural gas. So um, we are in favor of um, valuing the carbon-free electricity that comes from nuclear power plants and providing an incentive if we can't get an overall price on carbon, something to keep them in business. On the other hand, uh, building new nuclear power plants doesn't strike us as a good bet. It's just Every other uh, sector of our energy sector is going down in costs except for nuclear power. It doesn't make sense to spend billions and billions of dollars on nuclear power when you can build solar panels 
and wind farms and storage and geothermal. There's much better alternatives. Um, you said that uh, new tech in energy storage will make fossil fuels obsolete into the future. What do you feel that the timeline on that is? If I knew, I would be investing in the stock market heavily. Um, well, I will say this. I mean, I think uh, the same cost curve on lithium iron battery pack that I showed you for electric vehicles also applies to battery storage. So we're already starting to see in some countries with, with a lot of sun, um, where the choice of solar and storage is actually cheaper than any other alternative. Um, so I think we're going to get to this point in the next uh, 10 years. There's a lot of things we can do to accelerate it. Um, but I think, we're, I think we're going in that direction. I, again, this is why policy and economics intersect so importantly. Um, we need to either provide incentives for people to take on ener uh, energy storage, or we need to provide mandates or both um, to get this technology really scaled up. But I think it's going to happen over the next 10 years. Hi, thank you Hi. for speaking. Um, so I understand how specific like budget cuts or the undoing of like previous laws could specifically undo any growth in climate change. Do you think that the withdrawing from the Paris Agreement specifically will um, change how the US is reacting to climate change? Or do you think it was more of a symbolic decision? Does that make sense? Yeah. OK. It was more of a symbolic decision. Um, but of course, we not only have the pulling out of the Paris Agreement, we have the effort to undo some of the policies that we were counting on to actually meet our pledges. So it's a little more than symbolic. Um, as I said, I've been uh, pleasantly surprised by the reaction of the world community. Um, the this, this sort of cascading and uh, uh, unraveling of the agreement hasn't happened. But one thing that is going to happen, I think, um, next year, under the agreement, all the countries are supposed to get back together to start talking about how do we, how, how do they ramp up their level of ambition. And we actually were the ones who insisted on that measure because we, we, we wanted to get people back on a regular basis looking at how technology is making things more ambition possible. I am skeptical how, how well that will work without the U United States in. So I think that will be the first uh, moment in which we see a real effect from the pull out of the Paris Agreement. But as I also said, I think all the things that the states are doing and universities and businesses can make up for a lot of that difference. A few years ago, there was a project on Kickstarter that had garnered quite a bit of publicity with this idea that we might be able to convert all of our normal asphalt roadways into these hexagonally uh, based uh, roadways with solar panels. And I was just wondering if there's been any discussion or if you have any insight as to whether or not a more radical approach toward a climate positive solution like that might ever come into play. Um, I'm not that, I've heard of that, I'm not that familiar with it, but I think in, in general a, a more radical approach is needed. Um, and the technologies that I mentioned are all successful, they can still get better. Um, I'm very encouraged, for example, I've been reading about a company that puts solar panels in, in windows of buildings um, and collects a huge amount of solar power very, very cost effectively, um, and uh, apparently at a very low price, build, existing buildings can be retrofitted to have that. So I think there's a bunch of ideas out there. Um, I think to really drive that technology and get it adopted, um, you need something like a price on carbon or something that will make these investments um, really worthwhile to investors. Um, that's, that's the kind of policy we need to drive it. But there's a lot of great ideas out there, um, and I'm excited when I hear about them. And I think the technologies that we have now um, are probably enough to do the job, 
but there can be significant improvements upon them that could make it even, even easier. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to introduce myself. I am a state representative serving in the general court in Concord. Um, if you, I mean, we've, we've heard the importance of contacting governors and legislators. If you need any sense of a uh, connection with them, uh, I am very happy to serve as a liaison for any of you to get connected with the, the right committee or the right leaders. So. Thank you. Representative, thank you for your leadership. I'll just add, Patricia Hickens is our representative from Hanover and Lyme. So the general back there has been waiting patiently for a while, and then we'll take some more over here. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, uh, I just wanted to uh, thank you for your excellent overview of the dark cloud as well as the <laughs> silver lining. Uh, I noticed, uh, well, several silver lining, elements of silver lining you didn't point to, one being the fact that major oil companies now generally accept the standard paradigm in terms of climate change, and two, China has also bought into it. So those I view as favorable. On the other hand, the anti-science climate in the U.S. is notable and really uh, frustrating and uh, concerning. To what extent is the UCS uh, trying to reach that part of the electorate that subscribes to the uh, climate science hoax and uh, related aspects? And do you think the current court case against ExxonMobil that may well prove they hid um, uh, evidence showing climate change 25, 30 years ago, will that influence it? Thank you. Qu great questions. So uh, a lot of our work is based on climate communications and different things that we try to do to both uh, raise the level of urgency for people who do accept the science of climate change, but raise it to a top one or two or three issue. And we also employ an array of communication strategies to try to get those who are undecided about it onto our side. I want to be honest with you that a dyed-in-the-wool climate denier who just doesn't believe it at all and thinks it's a hoax and thinks it's being invented by university professors to get grants or whatever it is, they are, it is really tough to turn them around. And so there's always going to be some percentage of the population um, that you're not going to be able to reach. But um, we have found um, that we have been very, very successful when we communicate about local climate impacts to people. So for example, focusing on sea level rise and what that means uh, for people who live in communities that are soon going to be inundated um, or uh, people who experience droughts or wildfires. And what we found, especially around the coast where we focused so much on this, is we've seen uh, as we get out into these communities and connect the dots of the science to what people are experiencing, they come to uh, accept the science and their legislators start responding. And one success story that has flown under the radar screen a little bit, there is now a 60-person uh, bipartisan congressional solu climate solutions caucus in Congress, 30 Republicans, 30 Democrats. It's not surprising that most of the Republican members are people who represent communities along the coast, but not all of them. And I think that is, uh, that is that's happening um, because of the way that we're, we and others are communicating climate impacts. Um, there are some other ways to talk to people about uh, reasons to approve climate-friendly policies that have nothing to do with climate science. It could be the economics, uh, the advantages of having a diverse uh, energy supply, the local pollution benefits uh, of shutting down a coal plant. So, so that's all worthwhile, too, and, and important. But um, the real challenge from a communications perspective isn't so much persuading people who are just dead set against you. It's getting everyone to realize this is like the most important thing and raising the level of urgency in the here and now. And your second question was about the litigation against ExxonMobil. Um, so it, a couple months ago, five different 
uh, communities in California have filed suit against Exxon and a number of other uh, companies uh, claiming essentially that they knew all about the climate impact uh, associated with their products. They didn't, uh, they suppressed their own in-house science which was telling them that and they set off on a campaign essentially to deceive people about climate change and to sow doubt. And I, I firmly believe that's true. In fact, UCS issued something called the Climate Deception Dossiers about two years ago, which really set this whole thing off. And we documented pretty clearly what was going on. It's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to deny. So um, it is interesting. Uh, the chickens are coming home to roost now. And not surprisingly, lawyers who are representing California communities that are going to have to pay very, very significant amounts of money to prepare for sea level rise are asking the question, aren't these companies responsible for some of this impact and shouldn't they be forced to pay some of these uh, costs as opposed to all of us as taxpayers? So it's a very interesting case. Um, I think it's going to be a little bit like the tobacco litigation where a lot of suits are going to get filed and they're going to get thrown out. Uh, but eventually, eventually they will open the right door. Um, and this could be quite transformative. I don't know how long that's going to take. But, you know, the good thing about our legal system is um, usually, not always, if you've done something really wrong, usually you're held accountable for it at some level. And they, they did something wrong. These companies uh, have some of the responsibility here in terms of their conduct and, and what they did with their knowledge about climate change and what they didn't do with their knowledge about climate change. So I, I, think, I think eventually they're going to be required to pay for that. OK, I think we maybe take one more question, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Question from a colleague. Hi, Ken. Hi. Um, you said something that is intriguing to me, because you and I have worked with all the Massachusetts electric utilities. You said that people haven't really, that we could potentially pressure the electric companies on their generation sources. Across the river, we have Green Mountain Power that has done an extraordinary right. job. I don't think that was because of public pressure. Right. Do, are there any examples where the model has changed because of public pressure? Well, when I say public pressure, um, I, I don't mean you know storming them and doing civil disobedience. Um, I, I really mean public utility commissions at regulating them, giving them a clear sense of what the priorities are. And we've seen lots of examples of that. I mean, as, as you know so well, in, in Massachusetts, we basically told utility companies, we want you to get in the energy efficiency business. And we, we're going to uh, give you the resources, but we're going to expect you to lower energy use. And, and in fact, they've done that. Um, so I think we do have examples of it. Um, this is good business for them, obviously. If we go from <laughs> gas-fired cars to electric-fired cars, this is very, very good business for them. Um, but they are um, used to being regulated utilities. They're not terribly entrepreneurial. Uh, there are some exceptions, like Green Mountain Power. And they need a nudge. Uh, they need a push in a certain direction. And to me, we ought to be pushing them to um, put them in the driver's seat or partially in the driver's seat in terms of trans transitioning from uh, fossil fuel-based transportation to uh, electric transportation. I think it's a natural fit for them. OK, let's give Trent a big hand. Thank you.